Good evening. My name's Michael Desch, and uh, I'm a professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. I'm also the co-director of the Notre Dame International Security Program. Uh, I'm also a panelist this evening. Um, but before I uh, introduce my fellow panelists uh, on our uh, uh, program tonight, uh, I wanted to uh, address three things very briefly. Uh, first of all, our topic tonight is nonpartisan, as befits the ethos uh, of our respective educational, media, and philanthropic institutions. Um, but despite that, it would be naive uh, to think that uh, you are coming here for a nonpartisan uh, uh, reason. You're here because uh, the topic is uh, inextricably linked uh, to the 2016 uh, presidential campaign. Uh, it also would be disingenuous to deny uh, that our speakers have a point of view, and in fact, that point of view uh, will come out. Um, indeed, one of the core missions of the Notre Dame International Security Program, NDISP, and notice the anacronym, very important in national security affairs, particularly when they change. Uh, one of our key missions since 2008 has been to promote uh, first-rate scholarly research on topics of vital concern, not only to our fellow scholars, but also to policymakers and the informed public and I hope in the informed public you see yourselves. Um, one objective that I think uh, all of my colleagues on the panel share is a desire to promote the broadest possible discussion of the grand strategic and foreign policy options that the United States uh, ought to consider, particularly um, in the years ahead. And in fact, I think all of us uh, are John Stewart uh, mill liberals, big L liberals, who believe that a completely unfettered marketplace, uh, intellectual marketplace of ideas concerning these and other foreign policy issues is vital to the well-being of our country and indeed uh, to the rest of the world. Now, Endis has been privileged to be the recipient of the largesse uh, of Notre Dame's extremely non-domers might say fanatically, uh, loyal uh, alumni base. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, thank uh, a number uh, of our donors, including Jack Kelly and Gail Weiss, uh, Mike Long, uh, and Sean Riley. Um, also, my colleagues at Endisp and I have enjoyed uh, support uh, from major foundations, um, including the Carnegie Corporation uh, of New York. Um, but tonight, uh, I'm pleased and honored to be able to both welcome and thank our newest benefactor, the Charles Koch Foundation. Uh, CKF and its sister organization, uh, the Charles Koch Institute, have recently worked with, for example, the Obama administration and the American Civil Liberties Union on such cross-the-aisle issues as over-sentencing and criminal justice reform. And they're now branching out uh, into the area of national security affairs uh, and foreign policy with the objective uh, of broadening the debate uh, in the uh, American uh, political system on those issues as well, uh, as well. And indeed, as a result of CKF's generosity, I've used the anachronism, uh, or anachronym, not anachronism, <laughs> but it's also an anachronism because we're retiring NDISP tonight in replacing it with NDISC, the Notre Dame uh, International Security Center. Um, indeed, their five-year commitment uh, to uh, NDISC's uh, activities uh, has elevated us to the purple of being a university center uh, rather than just a program. So will you please join me in thanking the Koch Foundation uh, for this support. But this is way too much throat clearing. This isn't what you're here for tonight. Um, and uh, it's time for me to introduce the really terrific group uh, of speakers that we brought together uh, tonight to reflect on the general topic of uh, foreign policy uh, after 2016. Our first speaker 
will be uh, John Mearsheimer, who's the Wendell Harrison Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. We Notre Dame people know Chicago as the Notre Dame of Hyde Park. Um, <laughs> John is the author uh, of numerous books and articles, uh, including his magnum opus, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, which we have in the Notre Dame bookstore for stocking stuffers uh, for, uh, uh, for Christmas. He's the co-director of the Program on International Security Policy at the University of Chicago. Uh, and I always think of John like his distinguished predecessor, Hans Morgenthau at the University of Chicago, uh, somebody who's not only a great scholar, but also a leading uh, public intellectual um, on these and other related issues. Uh, so our second speaker uh, will be Steve Chapman, uh, a columnist and editorial writer for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, he's originally from Brady, Texas, so I have to speak Texan to him. <laughs> Howdy. I'm looking. Oh, <laughs> okay. Not bad. Yeah, well, <laughs> I wasn't born there, but I got there as quickly as I could, as the, the bumper sticker says. Um, he, Steve graduated with honors from Harvard University, which we refer to as the Notre Dame of the East Coast, <laughs> where he was on the staff of the Harvard Crimson. Uh, he came to the Tribune many moons ago uh, after a stint at the New Republic uh, where he was an associate editor. Um, our third speaker is uh, my old friend Will Ruger, who's uh, vice president for policy and research at both the uh, Charles Koch Institute and the Charles Koch Foundation. Uh, I've known Will since he was a graduate student, which is a long, long time. <laughs> um, and I followed his uh, career with great interest as he moved from academia into the foundation world, back into academia where he was a colleague of mine in Texas uh, for a number of years, um, and then back again uh, into uh, the foundation world uh, where he's at his uh, current billet um, at, with uh, the Koch Foundation and Institute. Um, and speaking of billets, uh, Will is a uh, Naval Reserve officer uh, who's uh, just come back from a hardship deployment <laughs> uh, in Stuttgart. Um, but he did some real hard time, uh, including uh, almost a year in Afghanistan. So each of our speakers uh, will have 10 minutes, if I haven't already taken like half their time uh, in the uh, introductions. Um, and then uh, we'll have plenty of time to open it up for uh, uh, rebuttals, uh, ad hominem attacks, uh, or whatever the audience uh, feels the need to uh, throw in our direction. So we'll go in the order that I've introduced folks, uh, John, Steve, Will, and myself. So without further ado, John. Yeah, I'm going to stand right there. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike, for inviting me. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, the subject is obviously what is American foreign policy going to look like after the 2016 election. And my basic argument is it's not going to change very much from what it is now. Uh, and uh, I actually find this kind of surprising at a rather superficial level because you would think after the foreign policy that we've executed for the past 15 years, there would be at least one or two candidates, serious candidates, who were talking about fundamentally altering the way we do business. I mean, the U.S. foreign policy establishment is the gang that couldn't shoot straight. It doesn't matter whether you got Republicans or Democrats. Everything they touch is a disaster. Right? Afghanistan, the longest war in American history. The only reason we can't get out is because if we do, we'll lose. But we're going to lose anyway, like we lost in Iraq. We did a great job there, didn't we? Uh, how many people were killed there? 25,000? Uh, 250,000? 500,000? Who knows the number? A huge number of people killed. The country's wrecked. It's broken into three parts. And by the way, in the process, we created ISIS. And then there's Libya. Remember Colonel Gaddafi? We told him, give up your WMD and we'll let you live happily ever after. As you all know, he's buried six feet under now. Compliments of the United States of America. Plus, after we got rid of him, the country 
ended up in a raging civil war. Speaking of civil wars, what about Syria? Oh, we've done a great job there. I could go on and on, right? <laughs> What's going on here, right? We're constantly intervening everywhere, losing wars, killing huge numbers of people. I mean, the amount of murder and mayhem we've spread in the Middle East is a sight to behold. Uh, I mean, you'd think that given this situation that somebody would be calling for some change, right? That we'd be talking about backing off. Do you really think that this is the indispensable nation that stands taller and sees further? As Madeleine Albright put it, I don't think so, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is really a bad news operation. But regardless, nothing's really going to change. You see this with Obama. The Republicans and the Democrats, except for people like Bernie Sanders and Rand Paul, who are not serious candidates, right? The serious candidates all say that Obama, that Barack Obama is basically a wussy. And what we really need is to get tougher, to do more on the foreign policy front. So no matter who is elected, we're going to be as hawkish as ever. Now, the question is, why is this the case? And I want to say that, that I think there are three reasons for this. The first has to do with the dynamics of the American political process. It's almost always been the case that political parties understand that being hawkish helps you at the ballot box. Uh, when some of the old dogs here were young, uh, we remember that John F. Kennedy, who was a Democrat, ran against the Republican Party, the party of Eisenhower and Nixon, for being soft on defense. And Kennedy got elected in part by running on a hawkish platform. But what's important here is to understand that during the Vietnam War, we had a huge split in this country between Republicans and Democrats, and Democrats were very dovish. And Democrats played the principal role in bringing the Vietnam War to an end. And of course, then in 1972, George McGovern was the Democrats' presidential candidate. What the Republicans came to recognize shortly thereafter is that being very hawkish on national security affairs and portraying the Democrats as a bunch of pussycats helped greatly at the ballot box. And there's all sorts of survey research that shows that this is true. So the Republicans in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and up to the present continued to pound on the Democrats for being soft on defense. The Democrats, of course, understand exactly what's going on. And no Democrat, therefore, is going to allow him or herself to be portrayed as soft on defense. So the Democrats go to great lengths to show that they're every bit as hawkish, every bit as tough as the Republicans are. And therefore, you have a situation, as you saw in 2012 with Barack Obama, where he basically took national security off the table. He was not going to let Romney beat him on national security by adopting one hardline position after another. And many people puzzle, how is it that Barack Obama, who ran basically as a dove in 2008, has turned out to be so hawkish? And the answer is, in the American political system, especially for Democrat, you have to be very hawkish. And the Republicans, of course, are always hawkish because they're looking for ways to defeat uh, the Democrats. So this sort of hawkish arms race between the Republicans and the Democrats is one reason we always have a hawkish foreign policy. Second has to do with the benefits to the elite in this country. We have a huge national security elite, mainly in Washington, but also spread on university campuses and think tanks and so forth and so on. And the fact is that war is good. Conflict is good. Crises are good. Uh, it generates jobs. And we have this huge national security establishment that provides lots of jobs. For example, at the University of Chicago, we have the Center for, uh, we have the Committee on International Relations that produces all these MA students. They have to find jobs. There's a national security establishment in which they can be employed. We have all sorts of aspiring uh, people in Washington who want to be national security advisor, who want important positions, right, who want to make lots of money. And you can do this in the national security business. You should understand that. It is a business. It's a job. And it's a really very attractive job. 
And if we pulled back our horns and we stopped trying to run the world, lots of people wouldn't have jobs. Think about the news media, right? The news cycle is 24-7. You have to fill all that space. We have a bombing in Paris. The broader public doesn't care that much, in large part because they're not paying a great price. Again, they're not being drafted. And number two, uh, there's a great deal of threat inflation that takes place in this country. And you see this in the wake of the Paris bombing. You see this in the discourse about ISIS. You would think that ISIS was this great threat that was killing huge numbers of Americans or was building military forces that were capable of projecting power into Europe and across the Atlantic Ocean. This is laughable. Uh, how many Americans do you think ISIS has killed? When I talked to Bob Pape, he told me that the number is 11, that ISIS has killed 11 Americans. They've killed 11 Americans. You're more likely to drown in your bathtub than to be <laughs> killed by ISIS. Why are we talking about this as an existential threat? There are probably about 30 or 40 at the most 50,000 fighters in ISIS. Hardly any military capability vis-a-vis -vis a country like the United States or any European state for that matter. An ideology that's utterly despicable and not attractive to many people. Why do we worry so much? But we do. Anyway, my bottom line is whether Hillary Clinton is elected or someone like uh, Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz or whoever is elected on the Republican side, it's not going to matter much for affecting our foreign policy. We're going to pretty much go on marching along the way we have been marching along uh, at least since 2001. And this, despite the fact that our foreign policy record since 2001 is truly abysmal. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I can't promise you that you're, there's going to be a big difference between what you, what you just heard and what you're about to hear because uh, when I got to Chicago in 1981 and I was starting to write an opinion column, uh, somebody told me, there's a, guy, a, new, a young guy at the University of Chicago you ought to get to know who's, <laughs> who's really smart about these things, and his name is John Mearsheimer. So I called him, and John Mearsheimer has spent really a scandalous amount of time educating me at, at, at no value to the University of Chicago. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, have another con I have a connection with Mike Desch as well. In fact, I, I, like, I take credit for discovering Mike Desch when he was a mere grad student for, who was your thesis advisor at the university? Oh, John Mearsheimer, yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he, wrote a, he wrote an article about uh, Central America, which I, I thought was very persuasive, and I quoted it in my column. And, and you can see where, where, uh, where it got him. Um, the rest is history. <laughs> uh, my uh, my uh, oldest son, when he was when he was in high school, he had a certain interest in the military, and uh, he graduated from high school in, in 2003, and he got an ROTC scholarship to uh, a school you may have heard of called Ohio State, you know, the Ohio State University. Uh, I, yeah, I figured I was going to get some booze from that, but it has a happy ending. Um, <laughs> I had mixed feelings about about this ROTC scholarship. He was he was going into the into the Army ROTC, and um, this was right after he, he had applied in the spring of 2003, which was when we invaded Iraq. And um, so I figured, okay, he's going to go into the Army. I figured, okay, I'm, I'm, this doesn't really worry me because it's going to be four years before he's going to graduate from Ohio State and get his commission and go into the active military. And there is no way on earth the American people will tolerate a U.S. military presence in Iraq for four years. It's just we learned our lesson in Vietnam. It's not going to happen. Um, well, that shows you my, my uh, predictive capabilities. Um, the good news is my son hated Ohio State. See, I told you it had a happy ending. <laughs> 
And so he left and he gave up his ROTC scholarship and he, he took another route. Um, now, my mistake was, was thinking that the lessons of Vietnam were still relevant to Americans of the 21st century. Um, and what those lessons were, were that, I, I, some of you are too young to remember Vietnam, and you're, you've seen the sort of political division and, and bitter partisanship that has arisen in the United States because of the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War and the War on Terror and so on. You cannot imagine how much more ferocious the divisions were during Vietnam than they are today, or than, and then they've been at any time in this century. Uh, if you, if Rick Perlstein wrote a book called Nixon Land, which is basically a history of the United States from the 65 until, uh, until the end of the Nixon administration. And I, I, I lived through those times and I read it and I still couldn't believe how insane the divisions were. There were bombings in the US, there were protest marches on campuses, there were students who were shot by National Guard troops. I mean, it was, it was an awful time and it was all because of the Vietnam War and the draft, as John mentioned. Um, one of the things that we learned one of the results of the Vietnam War was, it was called the Vietnam Syndrome, and it was, it was a pejorative term, which is we had grown overly allergic to military invention, intervention abroad. Um, and in, in the 1980s, Secretary of Defense under Ronald Reagan, Casper Weinberger, um, he came up with a doctrine, which I think is very reflective of sort of the lessons learned from Vietnam. I'm gonna take the time to read it if you don't mind had five basic elements. You, the U.S. should not commit forces to combat overseas unless the particular engagement is deemed vital to our national interest or that of our allies. Two, if we decide it is necessary to put combat troops into a given situation, we do so wholeheartedly and with the clear intention of winning. Three, if we do decide to commit forces, if, note, to combat overseas, we should have clearly defined political and military objectives. Four, the relationship between our objectives and the forces we have committed, their size, composition, and disposition must be continually reassessed and adjusted if necessary. Five, and most important, the commitment of U.S. forces to combat should be a last resort. Now, I'll remind you, this was a Republican administration under a man who is revered by every Republican alive, Ronald Reagan. Um, and what people forget about Ronald Reagan is he, he greatly enlarged the size of the U.S. military, the Navy, um, you know, started the Star Wars program. Um, Reagan thought you had a big, powerful military so you didn't have to use it, that it was peace through strength. It was, you, you didn't go around looking for wars to fight. You made, it, you made other countries reluctant to want to fight you. And it actually worked. From 1975 until 1991, we pretty much stayed out of wars. I mean, we had a few sm small engagements here and there. Uh, Ronald Reagan, by the way, sent some Marines into Lebanon to try and, and solve a civil war there. And as soon as, uh, as soon as a couple of hundred of them got killed, he pulled out. Um, he was not willing to <coughs> dive any deeper into that. Um, what changed was the first Gulf War, as we called it then, the first Iraq War. And um, that was a war that was actually based uh, f to a large extent on the Weinberger Doctrine, which as it evolved was known as the Powell Doctrine after Colin Powell. And we, we went at, the, 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 what we did in, in Iraq, in the first Iraq War is we had a huge force, we had a limited objective, we accomplished it, and we got the hell out. And I will point out one of the few people who knew how easy that war was going to be was John Mearsheimer. Uh, that, he wrote an article for the Chicago Tribune at a time when people were saying this could be another Vietnam or Korea. And he said, no, this is going to be easy. We'll, he'd be, we, we're, we're not going to lose more than a, a few hundred uh, troops in, in combat. And he, and he turned out to be right. Now, what we could have... Yeah, we could have done more than just push Iraq, Saddam Hussein, out of Kuwait, <clears throat> but we didn't. And let me, let me tell you why that was. Um, Dick Cheney, who was Secretary of Defense at the time of the Iraq War, um, was asked in 1994, 
why we didn't go into Baghdad and overthrow Saddam and solve that problem once and for all. And he said, because if we had gone to Baghdad, we would have been all alone. There wouldn't have been anybody else with us. There would have been a U.S. occupation of Iraq. None of the Arab forces that were willing to fight with us in Kuwait were willing to invade Iraq. Once you got to Iraq and took it over, took down Saddam Hussein's government, then what are you going to put in its place? That's a very volatile part of the world. And if you take down the central government of Iraq, you could very easily end up seeing pieces of Iraq fly off. Part of it, the Syrians would like to have to the west. Part of it, eastern Iraq, the Iranians would like to claim. They fought over it for eight years. And in the north, you've got the Kurds. And if the Kurds spin loose and join with the Tur Kurds in Turkey, then you threaten the territorial integrity of Turkey. Dick Cheney had amazing prescience about the situation in Iraq and the risk of a, of a full-scale occupation of Iraq. Where he went wrong, I don't, I don't know. How much time have I got, Mike? Three minutes. Okay. Um, in the 1990s, I mean, what we learned from the Iraq War is okay. You can get into into these wars, and you know, have a clear objective and get it over with and get out, and it's very low risk, very low cost. It worked in in uh, Bosnia, worked in Kosovo, and to some extent, it worked in Afghanistan early on. Um, all of those look pretty easy, and what that what what uh, President Bush learned from that. Uh, was that Iraq would be easy too. And I will remind you, George W. Bush, he, he had also absorbed the lessons of Vietnam because he spent a lot of time trying to stay out of it um, personally. Um, he ran in, 19, in 2000, Condi Rice was at, spoke at the Republican convention. She said, we're not going to have the 82nd Airborne escorting kids to kindergarten. And, you know, well, we, we didn't do that, that's for sure. Um, I think the reason John had a sort of political, political science explanation for why uh, we keep fighting these wars that we don't have to fight and that we don't know how to win and that we don't know how to get, a, get out of it, I think there's a psychoanalytical uh, explanation, which is during World War II and the Cold War, we developed a sort of notion of ourselves as the saviors of the world. And I think once c communism collapsed, we were left with kind of a void. You know, what's our purpose in the world? Is it just to make money and have a free society and enjoy life? Or do we have this mission to save the world? And to a large extent, I think we, we absorb this idea that we have, to, we have to save the world. And that's become, as John put it, we've become addicted to war. Um, I don't have any personal experience being an addict, but my understanding of addiction is that it's very hard to break. Uh, even if you try to break it, you're probably going to fail the first few times you try. And when you do try, it's a very, very painful process. It doesn't get better when you stop using heroin or stop drinking. Your body really reacts badly to it. It's a miserable experience. And it's a lot easier to say, you know, just a little more. If I just do a little bit, It'll, I'll feel better and things will work out better. And I think that's kind of what's happened to us in Afghanistan and Iraq. We keep thinking if we just keep doing it a little longer on a smaller scale, we'll be able to stave off the worst effects and eventually we'll be able to get out. Um, Johnny Manziel, you all know, um, <laughs> speaking of addicts, here's a guy who, you know, he's got, you know, he's got the world on a platter. He's the starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. And what does he do? He goes out drinking and celebrating and loses his job and he got it back and the first thing he said after he got his starting quarterback job back was i don't have a drinking problem the team has a problem with me drinking <laughs> and that's the basic attitude that american politicians have toward foreign intervention um, so as far as what i expect of the next president whoever it is whether it's hillary clinton whether it's marco rubio ted cruz um, i think that, that it's going to be pretty much the same um, if, if I were a betting person, I would bet that Johnny Manziel is going to start drinking again, and I would bet the United States is going to be still fighting wars four, four years from now.
So before I get started, uh, it's hard to follow these two guys for sure, uh, but I'm going to try. Uh, but I want to also just thank Notre Dame for hosting this event and for what I think is going to be a great investment in, in basic research and international security. And uh, I think at the Charles Koch Foundation, we're very proud to support the kind of research that's being done at Notre Dame, and in particular, the kind of research that Mike Desch is doing that gives us confidence that this is a great investment in higher ed. So I would want to thank Mike for helping bring this together. So John talked about why things aren't going to change. Um, and I'm not going to dispute that or confirm it. Um, but I'm going to talk about why they ought to change, basically why the status quo is not working and why we need to think about new alternatives. And one reason why we want to support research is because we want to make sure that we're having a broad republic of science on these types of issues that matter to our country. And, and I think we need more thinking. Right now, we have thinking between the 48-yard lines in Washington. We need to expand that thinking because I don't think it's working, and I'm going to talk about that. So what is this current approach we have? What is the status quo? Well, it goes by a lot of different names. Uh, one of the names is primacy. Another name is liberal hegemonialism, which is a, a name uh, coined by Barry Posen. You have deep engagement. You have the Roman option. Uh, advocates Robert Kagan and Bill Kristol have called it a foreign policy of benevolent global hegemony, uh, which is a mouthful. Um, I prefer the term primacy, um, and it's been the foreign policy that the United States has pursued now since at least the end of the Cold War. So this is not a uh, only a 9-11 or post-9-11 thing. This goes back much further. And some of our friends, Chris Lane, for example, thinks it goes all the way back to the beginning of uh, the 19th century. Um, so it's one of those things where it's not simply because, uh, sorry, the 20th century. It's not one of those things that's just happening because of 9-11. Now, I think that this is a mistaken approach to foreign policy and to grand strategy. I think it's expensive. It's too expensive. It's counterproductive. It's unnecessary, and it doesn't make us safer, and it's ill-fitting for a liberal republic. Not only that, the buzzword we hear on ac in academic campuses is sustainability, right? It's not sustainable. So why is that the case? Well, let me first tell you a little bit about what primacy is, so then I can tell you what's wrong with it. Well, primacy is a muscular foreign policy. It's aimed at preserving and extending America's hegemonic position in the international system. And as Barry Posen of MIT has noted, primacists believe that this preponderance of US power will also ensure global peace. So it's good for the United States. It's good for the world. It's a policy of active engagement, where you can try to structure the international environment in a manner favorable to US interests and US values. Indeed, primacists believe that US interests are coterminous with global goods. Now, of course, primacy requires American leadership and the, and the folks that John talked about helping lead that. It's good for your career, right? You get to lead the world, as John said. Uh, a long list of alliance commitments, so you get to go to places like Stuttgart. Um, a large and expensive military that can meet a lot of contingencies around the globe. And an active policy of spreading liberal values abroad, even if that necessitates military intervention and regime change, as it has in Iraq, Libya, and Syria, if certain folks had their way. So for primacists, the US must take the lead, as Kagan and Crystal noted over a decade ago, quote, resisting and where possible, undermining rising dictators and hostile ideologies. So it's, it's quite an ad adventurous grand strategy. Now what's wrong with the approach? Why isn't this a good thing? Well, the problem is that it actually undermines that which it claims to provide, which is American security and safety, not to mention US values, which includes it as this audience probably knows, the liberty of Americans. And I say this despite being a hardcore realist, although, I mean, I'm with John Mearsheimer on the stage, so I don't know if I'm that hardcore, but I say this as a hardcore realist, meaning that I'm no dove or naive believer in international law or international institutions. I don't think these are substitutes for power. Instead, I think that the anarchic international system is a self-help system where states must secure themselves in a dangerous or potentially dangerous anarchic environment or they risk their independence. So I think the United States should remain the world's greatest military power. It should have a robust nuclear, naval, and air force capability. Um, but I do think that primacy undermines our safety and our security and our liberty. OK, so why? Well, first, primacy is expensive in terms of blood and treasure. 
So over 7,000 American soldiers were killed in Iraq and Afghanistan since 9-11. We've spent $4 trillion on these wars, $4 trillion. That's a lot of money. And $8 trillion in interest costs that will go out to 2054. So you're talking about an additional $8 trillion for these two wars. And the Department of Defense annual budget is a half a trillion dollars a year and rising over the recently broken Bipartisan Budget Control Act caps. So this is a case in which it's extremely expensive in terms of that monetary cost. But again, it's really that human cost uh, that is really most troublesome. Secondly, many of our efforts are counter uh, productive and inflame the hatred of people around the globe. So fighting these wars of choice that we've chosen in order to promote American power or values in places like Iran, Iraq and Libya um, have destabilized their respective regions. You think about Libya, for example. That's spread into Mali and other places. Uh, they undermined our anti-proliferation efforts. Uh, we already heard about uh, the fact that uh, Muammar Gaddafi had, had kind of joined the, the states engaged in, in anti-proliferation. Uh, and now we have, a, we have a, system, a situation in which we've told the rest of the world by our actions, basically, we're going to flake on you uh, even when you cooperate. Uh, it's also undermined our counterterrorism efforts. And it's even harmed those who are, we are ostensibly trying to help. So think about Libya, right? We've actually made things worse for the people of Libya rather than better. And we've not helped American security in the process. We've also, I think, undermined faith in our values when we are forced by the necessities of international politics, or at least by what people consider to be the necessities, because I don't think it's necessary. But when, we've been, when we believe we've been forced to play ball with unsavory characters around the world, we've had to compromise our values. We've had to engage with what Ted Carpenter calls perilous partners, these kind of unsavory characters. And again, I'm a realist, so I think that's sometimes necessary. Uh, but it's not World War II, and there isn't a German threat. So is it really best to think about the enemy of my enemy really being my friend when there isn't that great threat like the German threat? And so I think if we can stay out of these compromises, all the better for our values. I also think primacy is a problematic because it's unnecessary. Now, you might not think that if you watch Fox News or read the Wall Street Journal, but the United States has a lot of things going for it in terms of our geostrategic position. We have two huge moats that separate us from strong or threatening powers, what John calls the stopping power of water. Uh, we are, we're continent-sized with plentiful resources, the world's largest economy, and a large growing population. Our neighbors are relatively friendly and comparatively weak, uh, representing zero military threat. And the ba balance of power in Europe and Asia is not in danger of being overthrown anytime soon. And importantly, the United States has great military advantages that will remain unrivaled in the decades ahead, even if right-sized in accordance with a different type of grand strategy. We have a superior Navy and Air Force that offer an exceptional deterrent capability, uh, and we can defeat attackers far from our shores, not to mention our nuclear deterrent capability, which will keep them from probably desiring to threaten them in any way. So a couple of just basic facts here. The United States has 10 aircraft carriers, and that doesn't even include if you, if you count uh, amphibious assault uh, platforms. The rest of the world combined has only 10, and no country has more than two. And people talk about the big China threat, they have kind of half, right? Well, they have one with a nice ramp. Um, so it used to be a casino. We used to be a casino, okay, right. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that the United States spends more on its military than the next seven or eight countries combined, and more than one third of total world military spending. We spend 4.5 times what the Chinese do, even though many talk about this great China threat. Now, of course, I think the United States should be vigilant about the threat posed by explicitly anti-American terrorist groups, especially those that seek to use weapons of mass destruction. However, we have to be realistic about the danger terrorism poses. It is rarely an existential threat, and it's often handled best by superior intelligence collection, police work, and special operations forces not large footprint militaries, and not half a billion or half a trillion dollars worth of things that aren't related to this type of fight. Now, despite all of our wealth and our fine military tradition, uh, America also is just isn't well suited for primacy. Our liberal values make it hard to do well. 
So counterinsurgency theory, a la David Petraeus, is said to take generations. But our system and our political culture make it unlikely that we could fulfill that charge, even assuming that coin theory is a good one. And Americans aren't that excited about the project, despite what Fox viewers might think. As Ian Bremmer of the Eurasian Group points out in his book on strategic choice, he says, the American people continue to tell pollsters that they don't really want it. They don't want an open-ended commitment to risk American lives and spend American dollars uh, to achieve goals of doubtful use here at home. And in 2014, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, their survey bore this out. Four in 10 Americans in that survey said that the United States should stay out of world affairs. Now this ticked down in 2015, but is still more than one third of Americans. Another thing is that primacy is based on a central planning fallacy that has proven false time and time again. We believe in American, uh, we believe that leadership in Washington oftentimes has the information, the cultural understanding, and the know-how to tear down foreign governments and rebuild foreign countries in our image. But we have seen this backfire horribly in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and to a lesser extent in Syria. Um, we have also fallen into what Hayek called the fatal conceit, that man is able to shape the world around him according to his wishes. Now the primacists believe that everything depends on us, but when in fact everything doesn't necessarily depend on us, and oftentimes we don't have the ability to affect changes as we would see fit, the enemy also gets a vote. And then lastly, primacy isn't sustainable either. So we had this unipolar moment, what Charles Krauthammer called the unipolar moment after the end of the Cold War. But that's fleeting. It isn't natural, right? It's a product of a very unique period in time in which one su superpower, the Soviet Union, collapsed, leaving the US without any serious challenger. And so the United States could gallop freely around the globe for some time. But that's an unnatural position that will ultimately be undermined and is often undermined actually by fighting these wars of choice that erode the strength of the hegemon. And when you put the economic advances of places like China together with the kind of natural diffusion and innovation and military technology you get, it's going to be harder for the US to maintain this unipolar moment over time, not easier. And then lastly, we have that budget crunch that makes it unsustainable. Our current approach is just expensive and contributes to our financial insecurity. Now, this is one of the reasons why Admiral Mike Mullen, a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, hardly a naive you know, kind of pacifist, he said that fiscal problems are the greatest national security threat that the United States faces. Right? This is said during the war on terror, he said that. Why? Because he understood that our fiscal problems are so dire that they threaten to erode our economy and the economy is the thing upon which our military greatness is built. And so you have to be really careful about undermining the conditions that allow you to be a superpower. And yet our foreign policy and our fiscal policies are doing that. And so we have to get a handle on that. It's not sustainable to continue doing this. So in conclusion, I think we need new thinking about the status quo, or sorry, we need new thinking because the status quo isn't going to work for the future. And again, we're excited to to partner with Notre Dame to think about new ideas in international security so that we can achieve better public policies in the future. Uh, and I think that, that academia provides that great kind of, um, kind of laboratory, uh, that scientific enterprise to help us have uh, a kind of better understanding of the world and hopefully better policy. So thank you very much. Well, I thought I was stealing their time. And so they've stolen it all back. So I'm going to have to go uh, uh, pretty quickly here. Um, I, I uh, have put myself in a, uh, a difficult position, both going after these three uh, terrific presentations, but also I'm going to talk about something that we actually have some of the uh, you know the world's experts on, uh, which is uh, public opinion um, in American foreign policy. So Steve sort of showed a little bit a leg of my uh, uh, my slides during the course of his talk. So, but I'll will just run through them really quickly. Um, the big question uh, on everybody's minds is what does the public want in terms of foreign policy? Um, and as I was going to say, you know, really, uh, what, who we should have up here is uh, Dina Smeltz and Craig Kafura. 
Rivera from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, um, who uh, since 1974, uh, when John Riley and Art Sear were running the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, it was called, called at the time, um, this has been uh, one of the uh, essential sources uh, of public thinking uh, or of uh, information on public opinion on foreign affairs. Um, now, full disclosure, I'm on this, public, the, this project's advisory board, although we'll see if I still am uh, nine minutes from now. Um, so uh, as the most recent um, uh, version of the uh, Chicago Council uh, poll has shown, um, public concern about terrorism, and in this case we're using uh, Islamic fundamentalism uh, as sort of a uh, a proxy for that. It starts um, in 1998, if I remember what it is. Right, right. And 9-11, uh, uh, 2001 is right at the end uh, of Steve's nose there. So it's not surprising that you would have a, uh, a spike uh, of anxiety uh, about it at that point. And then uh, a, a relatively quiescent period in terms of public anxiety uh, about this topic which all of a sudden uh, in 2014 uh, has surged up again. So the question is, uh, what's going on? Well, the other thing I just want to mention or keep in the back of your mind, and this comes out of the Chicago Council uh, data, um, is that uh, the American public uh, has concluded, at least as of 2014, um, that both the Afghan war um, and the Iraq war just weren't worth, weren't worth it. Um, and this is really a tripartisan uh, sensibility at this point. I mean, you wouldn't be surprised if the old George McGovern Democrats like John Mearsheimer uh, were tired of the war. Um, but good rock rib conservative Republicans um, have also uh, concluded in both of those cases uh, that the, uh, the blood and treasure we expended there um, in trying to rebuild those societies uh, was wasted. Now, this is really an interesting finding given uh, the contretemp at the second Republican debate in which uh, Governor Jeb Bush, uh, you know, tried to defend uh, his brother's conduct of the Iraq War, and the, o the other 18, were there, or 19 <laughs> Republican uh, <laughs> pretenders, uh, or aspirants, excuse me, at the time, uh, you know, all sort of uh, tripped all over each other to hop on the bandwagon back to Baghdad. So uh, that's sort of a puzzle. So that raises the question of what's going on with, uh, with public opinion. And it seems to me that there are two ways to think about uh, public opinion. One is that it's a response to events in the real world. You've got ISIS coming online and they're chopping people's heads off on TV and they have very nice websites. You have a series of attacks uh, overseas, uh, two in Paris, um, and you have most recently uh, attacks that seem to have been inspired by uh, ISIS uh, in our own country um, in San Bernardino. So if this is what's going on, and here I've got some uh, formulas because I'm a political scientist. Um, any discipline that has science uh, in the title you have to wonder about. Um, but we do think, try to think systematically uh, about uh, uh, political phenomenon. And so, you know, basically the argument here is that what's happening in the world affects public opinion. And then, and this is an important step if you think this is how public opinion operates, that the public then uh, constrains the leadership or directs the leadership uh, in terms of what foreign policies uh, the country would adopt. Now, if this theory of foreign policy is right, um, it's a good thing, or at least it's more encouraging uh, than some of the other uh, uh, things you've heard tonight. First of all, the public's responding to things that are actually happening, um, and these responses are predictable, and it's basically the debate about how to respond to them is largely an argument uh, about facts and logic. Um, and as I suggested before, um, that uh, you know, ultimately public opinion is the driving force in terms of American foreign policy. So that's explanation one. 
But there could be a different dynamic going on. Um, and in fact, uh, implicit or maybe even explicit in some of my colleagues' presentations um, has been that the, uh, the causal chain uh, between uh, f uh, public opinion and foreign policy uh, is exactly the opposite or the reverse uh, of what uh, the first explanation suggested. In fact, what it's about is uh, about domestic politics and especially elite leadership shaping public opinion uh, about events in the world. Now, undoubtedly, it's the case that the relationship between public opinion um, and uh, you know, the behavior of a state in terms of foreign policy uh, is complex, and the arrow runs uh, both ways. But this latter dynamic uh, is worrisome. Uh, it opens up the possibility um, that uh, the leadership can, in fact, uh, shape uh, public opinion uh, rather than uh, the other way around. And so it makes foreign policy debates no longer about facts and logic, but about perceptions uh, and especially uh, emotions. Um, and it's not uh, you know, a, a recipe for a sound uh, foreign policy um, if politicians can frame and spin events in the world to their own advantage. Now, I want to add a caveat. If college professors uh, were the elites that were shaping foreign policy, none of these pathologies would apply. But every other elite uh, is deeply problematic. Um, and given that, it seems to me it's no accident that the uh, public fear of Islamic fundamentalism spiked coincident with the beginning uh, of the 2016 campaign. Not that there weren't uh, uh, events in the world and raw material that could get people ginned up, um, but really the difference between the results uh, of the Chicago Council's 2014 survey and 2015 survey on a whole host of questions um, are really dramatic. Now, you say this could never happen in a democratic political system in which the vox populi uh, runs the, uh, the country. But let me suggest that there's a long tradition uh, of uh, manipulation uh, of foreign policy to the ends of political rule, rule. Now, I'm a college professor. I give pop quizzes. We have a lot of Notre Dame alums, one of the elite liberal arts college, colleges in the country. Where did this famous quote come from? Be it thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels that action, hence borne out, may waste the memory of former days. Oh, come on. It's only today in recent years that uh, the liberal arts have been in trouble. Um, this is Shakespeare, Henry IV, uh, part two. Now, you may say, oh, well, that's, uh, you know, that, that's uh, the Middle Ages. But in fact, uh, and here's another product placement. <laughs> I'm getting a royalty from John on every uh, book of his that I, uh, that I mention. Uh, in fact, the tradition uh, of politicians uh, spinning uh, world events to their own advantage uh, is alive and well. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters for a couple of reasons. First of all, intellectually, um, it raises the question uh, of what's the relationship between uh, uh, foreign policy beliefs and the policy uh, that a state uh, actually embraces. And this is not, as, not at all uh, straightforward because I think the evidence is that it runs both ways. Um, secondly, it's a policy issue. If the public can be spun on these issues, then to understand American foreign policy, you not only need to understand ISIS, but you also need to understand uh, us as well. How the political system, uh, and particularly in an intense uh, electoral cycle, uh, how foreign policy issues get sucked up into that big machine um, and uh, end up uh, uh, coming out the other end in a way that influences public opinion. Now, we talk a lot about political entrepreneurship. And I don't know why I cho chose this picture when I was thinking political <laughs> entrepreneurship, because really, uh, you, you see more broadly 
uh, politicians uh, using foreign policy um, as a part uh, of their uh, political strategy um, to, get, to get elected. So what is to be done, just very quickly? Uh, first of all, I think we need to have uh, a more sophisticated understanding Dina has this sophisticated understanding, but the rest of us, uh, I think, uh, don't appreciate the extent to which public opinion can be, be manipulated and the pressure is within our democratic political system to manipulate it in a particular way for electoral gain. Um, secondly, we need to think about what are the short-term trends, the sort of campaign silly season uh, issues and what are the longer term trends in American foreign policy. And I'm just going to throw this out uh, for the sake of argument and say that I think the spike in terrorism fear is primarily an artifact of electoral politics. Um, I'm more optimistic, I think, than uh, John and uh, Steve. I think the more fundamental uh, dynamic among the public uh, is a fundamental war weariness. Um, and that, yeah, you can get them spun up uh, to be worried about uh, Islamic fundamentalism, um, but what's the winning solution to that? Donald Trump wants to shut the, shut the gates, keep Muslims from coming into the country. I haven't heard uh, uh, Trump talking a lot about sending more troops uh, to uh, Iraq or to Syria. Okay, but finally, and this sort of dovetails with the last point that uh, Will made, uh, I think uh, that people need to appreciate the, uh, the role that uh, independent analysts have in terms of providing a reality check um, on the nature uh, of the foreign policy events that get sucked up into the news cycle uh, and the political campaign cycle um, here in our country. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, especially those of us uh, pointy-headed intellectuals um, who uh, make our lives in the ivory tower are any smarter or any less biased um, than politicians or bureaucrats. But rather, what I'm saying is, is that uh, we have different strengths and weaknesses um, than government bureaucrats, military officers, um, and especially politicians. Um, and we should be part of the mix that uh, builds a more robust marketplace of ideas um, and hopefully uh, leads to uh, a better um, and uh, more credible series of foreign policies for the United States.